Acute coronary syndrome is a term that describes a range of conditions related to sudden reduced blood flow to the heart. The most common symptom is chest pain or discomfort. This is often described as aching, pressure, tightness, or burning. The pain can also radiate or spread to other parts of the body, most commonly the shoulders, arms, upper abdomen, back, neck, or jaw. It's also important to remember that many patients will present with so-called atypical cardiac symptoms, such as nausea or vomiting, indigestion, dyspnea, diaphoresis, tachycardia, or just feeling weak or dizzy. This is especially common among the elderly, women, and diabetics. The culprit responsible for a heart attack is plaque. Plaques are fatty deposits that line the arteries that supply blood to your heart. Over time, the plaques enlarge and narrow the artery, decreasing blood supply. Many factors such as age, diet, activity level, and genetics can influence the accumulation of plaque, but all adults are at risk for this condition. That decreased blood supply decreases the amount of oxygen available to the heart cells and can result in ischemia and chest pain, especially on exertion but may not cause any symptoms at all. When that chest pain is relieved with rest or by taking nitroglycerin, it is called stable angina. When those simple steps no longer relieve the pain, it is classified as unstable angina and is often an indicator of a worsening obstruction. A heart attack occurs when the plaque ruptures, causing a blood clot to form, partially or completely blocking flow to a region of the heart. This results in injury or death to cardiac muscle cells downstream from the obstruction. This animation illustrates that progression. The darkened area here represents dead cardiac tissue that prevents normal muscle function and therefore decreases cardiac output. I will attempt here to break down the ACLS algorithm for acute coronary syndromes into very simple terms that are hopefully easy to remember. If our patient has the signs and symptoms outlined earlier, we need to first provide basic care while completing our assessment. That means monitoring and su supporting airway breathing circulation. We should be ready to do CPR if needed ready to do early defibrillation if that becomes necessary. We should administer aspirin. We should get a 12 lead early in the process. And if we find evidence of a STEMI, that activation should happen early in the process as well. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. We should also be collecting and completing a fibrinolytic checklist to determine if our patient is or is not a candidate for fibrinolytics. Assessments and treatments go hand in hand. And many of these things can happen simultaneously, but it's important to acquire a 12-lead ECG prior to the administration of nitroglycerin, as the vasodilation caused by nitro may hide the evidence of an MI that our 12-lead would show us. During this stage, we're getting vitals, we're obtaining SpO2, end tidal CO2, a history and physical, which helps us to complete that fibrinolytic checklist, establishing an IV, or more than one IV, oxygen titrated to stay at or above 94%, aspirin as mentioned, nitroglycerin, um, sub sublingual, either a spray or a tablet, and morphine is also an appropriate intervention at this point. The reason we do a 12 lead early on is that it is our best tool for early identification of an acute MI. Based on our 12 lead, we will place our patient in one of three categories. The first is STEMI. If we have ST elevation criteria, we see ST elevation in two or more contiguous leads indicating that there's a region of the heart that's being impacted, that's evidence that this patient is having an acute MI. At the other end of the spectrum would be the non, the no STEMI. When we have a normal or non-diagnostic 12 lead, in other words, nothing on our 12 lead shows us any abnormalities in heart function. And then the third category falls in between those two. And these can be high-risk patients. These are your non-ST elevation patients. In other words, there isn't ST elevation evidence that meets our criteria to call it a STEMI, but there are changes 
to your 12 lead, such as ST depression or dynamic T wave inversion. And those need to show up in injury patterns, meaning we can see in contiguous leads evidence of that ST depression or T wave changes that tell us that this is related to a blockage to an obstruction that is impairing the blood flow to a region of the heart. These are strongly suspicious of an ischemic or even an infarct event, even if we don't have ST elevation criteria. So let's break down how we manage each one of these three categories. If we determine our patient is a STEMI, they meet the ST elevation criteria, or depending on your system and how this criteria is utilized, the new onset of a left bundle branch block. Now I'll mention real quickly, a new onset left bundle branch block is in this category because the most likely reason that someone would have a new left bundle branch block is because they're having an infarct. However, in many EMS systems and in some cardiac care settings, the left bundle branch block alone is not considered STEMI criteria because it can be very difficult to differentiate between the ST changes inherently produced by a left bundle branch block compared to the evidence that this is a new event. If your patient falls into this STEMI category and you've decided that's the category they fit in, then our treatment is focused 100% on reperfusion. The best possible way to reperfuse is through a percutaneous coronary intervention in a cath lab, going in and physically opening up that vessel, placing a stent. Or in systems or in settings where you don't have access to a cath lab quickly, fibrinolytics can be a good intervention, a good option for opening up those vessels. The earlier we do that, the less damage will occur and the better the patient outcome. At the other end of the spectrum, as I mentioned before, we have a normal or a non-diagnostic 12 lead. These are low to intermediate risk patients. And the reason there is still risk is that if we're on this algorithm, if we're talking about acute coronary syndromes, we've already decided we think there might be something cardiac going on. And it's really important to remember that a normal 12 lead does not eliminate the possibility of an MI. A large percentage of MIs will not show up as a STEMI, at least not early on. So we still need to treat these patients appropriately. Treat chest pain with nitro and or morphine, provide oxygen if needed. Remember to acquire repeat 12 leads and reassess these patients regularly. If their symptoms are the result of a blocked artery, it's likely that that is going to progress and worsen. And even if your first 12 lead didn't show evidence of an MI, a subsequent 12 lead might. And then we have that in-between category. I mentioned the non-STEMI. This is not to say that this patient is not having an MI. These are the patients that we suspect are having an MI, but they are not showing us ST elevation. They have changes in their 12 lead. They have evidence that makes us suspect there is infarct or injury happening to cardiac tissue. Uh, and so that's what puts them into this higher risk category. With these patients, similar to our non-diagnostic 12 lead, we still need to monitor them closely. We need to treat chest pain with nitro and morphine if appropriate, provide oxygen. But these patients also are likely to need five further diagnostic tests. If you work in an EMS setting, most of this is going to need to be done at the hospital. Uh, lab values, troponin levels, other diagnostics can be done to verify uh, whether or not there is an MI going on and ongoing Again, repeated 12 leads, reassessment, with the awareness these patients could be experiencing an acute myocardial infarction and just haven't yet shown us the evidence. To summarize, if your patient has the signs and symptoms of an acute coronary event, we need to provide basic care and acquire a 12 lead as early as possible. If that 12 lead gives us ST elevation evidence of an acute MI, our treatment and transport decisions need to be entirely focused on opening up those occluded arteries. If we do not have STEMI evidence, we still need to assess and be prepared for the possibility of an MI and treat and transport appropriately, assessing for changes and treating accordingly.